are we this morning? Man, I'm, 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 I am so excited to be here with you today to, to be able to talk a little bit with you. Uh, my name is Robert Bacon, and I'm blessed to be one of the administrators of Vintage Christian Academy uh, and just to be a part of what is happening here within the Vintage community. Uh, we are a light on the hill, guys, and, and y'all are leaders uh, within this community of faith that we have here. And so uh, to be here in front of you, to be able to share a message that God has put on my heart is, uh, is just an honor and a blessing. Um, like I said, my name is Robert Bacon. I am a, uh, I am a man of Colleen, Texas. I am born and raised here, uh, product of Hay Branch Elementary, Rancer Middle School and Colleen High School, uh, and, uh, went, uh, went, went to all my years here at Colleen. And, and, and I love this community. Um, sometimes it gets a bad rap, you know, uh, but there, a lot of you probably came here due to, due to Fort Hood. Um, and, uh, we're, we're glad that you're here because God has a plan for you within this community. God has a plan for you here. And with it being so close to Father's Day, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit about fatherhood. Uh, I got to marry my beautiful bride uh, nine years ago as of this past uh, Wednesday. And uh, we uh, thank you so much. Um, we have two boys. We've got uh, Curtis, who is eight, and uh, we have Harvey, who is six. And, uh, you know, they, they, you see them around here, they're running around, they're having fun, they go to VCA, uh, they're involved here in the church, and, and uh, it is just fantastic to, to have a community of believers and men like y'all to be able to help raise them up in truth and light. And what, what I don't want today, since I am talking about fatherhood, and I am talking about Father's Day, it being tomorrow, what I don't want you is to check out. Okay, you might say to yourself, well, you know, I, I'm not a dad, so coach, I don't have to listen to that right now. Or you might say, you know, hey, I'm a granddad, my kids are out of the house, I've already done my job, I don't have to listen to that. Your job is very important in the role that God has you in right now. God has you in a spot right now to where you can be influential in all that you do. And single guys out here, young men, pro odds are it's going to change. Okay, God has somebody to be able to put in your life. There's going to be a transition point at some time in your life. And what I want to be able to equip you with as an educator is I want you to know the answers to the test before the test is given. I want you to be able to sit there and understand that, hey, when, when, when I do get married, this is what the Bible says it should be. Because the world is trying to switch that up on us, guys. The world is trying to say that marriage is something that you necessarily don't have to do. Why hitch yourself to something when you can just be free and do what you want to do? But that's not the way of the Word of God. That's not what the Bible tells us. And when it comes to raising kids, we have to start early. We have to be able to imprint them with a message that is going to have them live right. Amen. And I want to show y'all a video about how guys are doing that today. You know, my son is getting older and we're approaching the time where we're going to have to have the talk. I mean, there's a real battle going on out there for the hearts and minds of our children. We decided to be more proactive and intentional with our daughter. My father instilled in me this passion and his father before him. I feel tremendous pressure to get this right. All you can hope for is that they remember everything they were taught. It's important to start young when building a foundation. When the hard times hit, they won't stray. They will remain faithful. It's never too early to introduce your kids to your favorite sports team. We live in Dallas, so a lot of the kids on the playground are cowboy fans. We're going to try to keep her cowboy free as long as possible. I had her yelling Lakers when she was still in the womb. This is a legacy that I want to pass down to my kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, my great-grandkids, grandkids, you know, if the world still exists. There are a few very important things that he needs to know before growing up. One, that Michael Jordan is the best to ever play the game, hands down. I don't want my son to grow up in a world where LeBron James is the greatest of all time. I mean, six championships, end of discussion. 
Cowboys cheat, the Cowboys killed SpongeBob, whatever it takes to get this idea out of her head that the Cowboys are cool, I will do it. If it means dressing up like a cowboy and scaring her in the middle of the night with a chainsaw, I will do it. <laughs> I don't want to have to force it on her, but let's face it, I'm gonna have to. It's the Royals we're talking about. I have a daughter, but hey, who said it was gonna be easy? It's all about being intentional. All you have to do is plant the seed. As a Red Sox fan, I, I really want to teach him. Hey, Dad, Mom made you downstairs. You know, I, I didn't start early enough with that one. <laughs> I wish I had. Could I accept my son liking another team besides mine? No, I couldn't. Does that make me a bad father? No, it makes me a great father. <laughs> <laughs> But guys, man, isn't isn't that the the, the truth right there? And uh, yeah, what, what I loved is like there was a one line in there about the Royals, and I heard one clap in the back. Some guy, yeah, they're a, Ro a Royals fan right there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, isn't that the truth? If we were to take that sports analogy and we were to tie it in to biblical living and Christ-centered life, what kind of world would we be in today? If we were to take the passion that we have for a lot of the sports, and it might be other things, you, you plug in the blank right here. If we were to take that passion and we instilled it into our kids, man, it would change the world. It really would. And, and that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. So if you have your notes in front of you, what I like to do, uh, I'm also a Bible teacher here at the school, and so I want to give kids notes before they start so they can kind of lock in. I'm not calling you kids, but if you want to write these down real fast, um, most of what, you, uh, what your kids learn is caught and not taught. And we're going to go through this in the slides here in a second too. But most of what your kids learn is caught and not taught. All right, uh, another one that we have here is that we want to uh, raise the children. Raising the children is the responsibility of the father. Raising the children is the responsibility of the father. Not disciplining your children is abusive. To not discipline your child is abusive. And a child's actions are a reflection of their spiritual health. And as we go back through these guys, I'm going to tie in scriptures that we have in Proverbs that kind of, you know, uh, biblically center this for us. Um, so, so, so those are some things that we're really going to hit on today. Uh, and one thing that I've taught for a while, and I love teaching it, was I was a history teacher. I taught U.S. history uh, to high school students, and it was a great time because they're, they're, they really are a blank canvas, like, all they know is, is TikTok and, and, you know, things like that. Really, that's, that's what they know. And so when they come in there and you're able to, to paint on that canvas and be able to uh, give them the truth when it comes to history, uh, you'd be surprised at how, how the scales fall off their eyes. It really does. Uh, and one thing that I've always loved teaching history about is being able to give them some famous sayings throughout history. And so if y'all could just do a little bit of back and forth with me here on this one, okay? Uh, and, and if y'all know who said it, y'all just yell it out. It's okay. You're not going to look like that guy, but you are going to be that guy. And that's fine, all right? So give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, there we go. All right, there you go, good, good stuff right there, okay? Another one that we have here is we have nothing to fear but fear itself. FDR, exactly. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. JFK, all right. <laughs> the recruiter, amen. <laughs> Never give in. Never, never, never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in. Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill. It depends on the, what the word, what the meaning of the word is, is. Some older guys, Bill Clinton, exactly. Some older guys in here know what I'm talking about with that one right there, okay? All right. So, so there, are, there are sayings 
And that one right there doesn't match up with the rest of them, and I get that one, okay? <laughs> but there are sayings in history that have reverberated through our timelines. There are things that have been said in history that stick in our minds. And what I want uh, to, for us to look at today, and the first scripture that we're going to open up is in the, uh, Joshua chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles, if you can crack that open with me, please. And we're going to start here with Joshua 24. And we're going to end up in verse 15, but before we do that, I want to be able to give you a little background as to what's happening here, okay? Here it says, Then Joshua assembled the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders and leaders, judges and officials of Israel, and they were presented themselves before God, okay? So Joshua is at the end of his life. He's on the back end of things. And so everybody is assembled before this leader. And Israel hadn't necessarily been walking the way that they wanted to go. Israel hadn't been following what was given to them by Abraham. They were kind of going in their own way, and it was really affecting the nation at that point. And so Joshua, in his later years, he stands before them, and he says these things right here. He says to them, But if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which are beyond the Euphrates rivers, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live today. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I think that's really the exclamation point that Joshua was trying to put on this thing. That last line right there, you have heard that. You've, you've seen that on doorways of people's homes. You've seen it on plaques outside your Christian brothers' and sisters' houses or places of business. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He had to say this because the nation of Israel wasn't headed in the right direction. He had to be able to say this because they have drifted away from God and they had uh, decided that they wanted to worship other gods. How does that relate to our world today? Do we live in a world today that has drifted away from the biblical principles? Do we live in a country today that has drifted away from biblical principles and is doing their own thing? What we need today, gentlemen, is men to stand up and to be able to exclaim, not quietly, not in a hushed voice, but to stand up and say that we are going to do what we do, and that is serve the Lord. You and your house can do what you want to do, but I don't give a rip what you tell me. I'm going to serve the Lord. But what's interesting about this is that at this point right there, he didn't say, but it's for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Right, honey? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say it. He didn't say that right there, guys. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Is that okay with you? No. He took leadership as the man that was leading his family and said, we're going to do this. My wife's coming along. My kids are coming along. And we're going to follow Christ in what we do. Amen? Amen. And a lot of times that's hard. A lot of times it's hard to be able to stand up and, and because you're going to lose friends. You're going to lose people that you thought were close to you. Okay, and you got to understand this about Joshua. If we look back into the book of Joshua, he is a great soldier, but he has not always been the bravest of man. He hasn't. Okay, there are times, three times in the beginning of Joshua, God had to tell them, God, God had to tell them, stand up, be strong. Be strong in the faith, Joshua, follow me, follow me. He had to say it three times. And then the people had to say, Joshua, stand firm and be strong. And if you do it, we will follow you like we did Moses. But if you know the Bible, hey, you know, how, how they followed Moses, that was kind of shaky at times too. Uh, hey, thanks, I appreciate that, guys. Uh, but they, he had to be encouraged, and he was a man of battle. This guy went in with swords and did what he did to be able to conquer areas, but sometimes he had to have encouragement. And that's what I want to do today, guys. I want to encourage y'all to be able to stand up and do things for God and exclaim that you and your household is going to serve the Lord. And, and that might be a little bit tough in the world that we live in today, okay? Now, another thing here is that we also have to understand that 
the world today is not a, a great place for our children. It's not. Okay? Uh, there, there's some statistic out there that I'd like to be able to share with you today. All right? One in three children are products of abortion. And I know that's a tough thing to be able to talk about, guys. There's things that I'm going to say up here that might hurt your feelings, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the Bible. It's biblical truth. One in three children do not have a father listed on their birth certificate. There's guys in here that don't have a dad listed on your birth certificate. 40% of children will go to bed without a father in their home tonight. Two in five high school kids are on medication for mental disorders. And that's up 70% from 20 years ago. So what does the Bible tell us about this? How, how can we, as men of God and men of faith, be able to take this and be able to try to correct this course that we are on right now? If y'all will, let's flip, flip over to the New Testament real fast, and we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And if you could please find Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, it says to us right here, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may turn out well for you and that you may live long on this earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We have to understand that there has been a shift in fatherhood today. We have to understand that fathers have moved from what they once were to what they currently are now. And the fathers of old, I, I mean, I, I grew up with my grandparents, guys. My grandparents raised me since I was three years old, amazing people, products of the greatest generation. And I, I, I couldn't watch new stuff. My granddad controlled the clicker. Anybody else have it called it a clicker? All right, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you know, he controlled the clicker. And there was things that was going to come through that TV into our house that, that he filtered. And uh, some of the fathers that I knew growing up were what I call fathers of old. And some of these fathers we can see up here. Y'all remember these guys? All right, Ward Cleaver, man, leave it to Beaver. All right, Andy Griffith, Little House on the Prairie, Bonanza. I mean, uh, just, just those, those old school feel-good kind of families that went through some turmoil. But man, after the end of that 22 minutes, everything was right. They opened up the Bible and, and, and life was good, correct? All right. Now let's look at what society calls the fathers of today. This is fatherhood. Al Bundy. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, all these guys up here, there has been a shift in the role of fathers in today's world. And I'll be honest with you guys, has it been for the better or has it been for the worse? I think it's for the worst, for what they want to be able to portray fathers as. We've got to be able to understand that we need to go back to the ways that it was. We need to go back to fathers that were leading their homes. We need to go back to Joshua 24 dads. And one of the guys that did that back in the day, and I, and, and I always loved the program because I could always tell when it was on, on in the living room. My granddad was watching it due to the whistling. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Automatic there, Andy Griffith show, man. All right. So this is a clip from Andy Griffith that talks a little bit about fatherhood. Boy, would be happier your way. Why not let him decide? No, I'm afraid it don't work that way. You can't let a young one decide for himself. He'll grab it the first flashy thing with shiny ribbons on it. And when he finds out there's a hook in it, it's too late. The wrong ideas come packaged with so much glitter, it's hard to convince them that other things might be better in the long run. And all a parent can do is say, wait, trust me, and try to keep temptation away. Man, first book of Mayberry right there. <laughs> Guys, the analogy that he uses in this spot right here I think is spot on. He says in here, can't let him decide for himself. They're going to grab at the first shiny things with ribbons, and when he finds out there's a hook in it, there's too late. 
What's the analogy that he's making that to? Fishing. All right, man, you can learn a lot by just sitting out and fishing a little bit, can't you, gentlemen? How many of you know Satan's got a big tackle box? And he's going to tie it up with, you know, some nice, man, he's got that, that spinner bait. You know, it's got that glitter on it. It's rolling along, and we are those fish just sitting right there in that moss. And when it pops along and it looks good, man, we strike it. And before it's too late, we realize there's a hook in that thing. We're getting reeled in, right? And I think that's what God is, 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 in a way, is telling us here in Ephesians 6 on fathers how to be able to lead their household. So what I want to do real fast is I just want to do a quick breakdown of Ephesians chapter 6 and be able to see some things that the Lord might have in between the lines of his scripture when it comes to this. It says right here, children, obey your parents in the Lord. See, the problem with today's world, guys, is that we live in a world that says that kids can't be good. That kids can't, that they're just going to be rascals. However, we also live in a world that says, well, let them be themselves and discover themselves. We can't have both of those things. We've got to understand that kids, yes, they're going to be kids. There's going to be issues. But when those issues arrive, we have to be there for them so they can watch out for those hooks. So they can be able to see where the bait's at and how, it's, how it might attack them. You see, we live in a world that says let them discover themselves. And now we've got a world that is confused about how to discipline children. We're going to get a little bit more into discipline here in a second. But way back in the 50s and 60s, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Spock. And I'm not talking about Star Trek here, okay? All right, Dr. Spock wrote a book, all right? In the book, it was called uh, Babies and Child Care. And it was an anti-spanking book, okay? It said that, that how we discipline our kids and the setup of how we discipline our kids needs to be softer and gentler, and we need to let more of the mom into this picture of this thing. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, gentlemen. It, 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 it's actually the reverse in this, and we're going to go into this a little bit more right here. And it's the next verse that gives us the key on this thing, okay? He calls out fathers directly. He says, fathers, God gives dad the directive to be able to lead the family. Dads are the ones that set the tone. And we always hear, man, kids these days, man, kids can't get right. Man, these kids these days, you see that kid over there? You know, golly, kids these days. No, not kids these days. Dads these days. Don't allow them to get to that point. Be able to hold them back. Be able to let them know where that hook is at. Guys, it can't. It, it's never too late. It's never too late to be able to start, to be able to, to, to push kids in the right direction. It's not moms. that. It's not the mom or the kids. We need to understand this. It's about a lot of kids today that are coming from single parent homes. And a lot of them, the mom is leading that home. And, and it's amazing to me because a lot of these single-parent homes, when we look at the statistics, how many kids that are in prison for abuse are coming from a single-parent home where the mom is the one that's in charge of the household. Men, we are instilled with the spirit of, of, of some rowdiness. That is within us as guys, to be able to take on adventures, to be able to step out into the world and do some things that might be just a little bit unsafe, to be able to wrestle be able to go out and hunt, do things like that. that. That's guy stuff right there, okay? And when you put a mom in charge of a young man, and, 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 and guys, we can't do this without moms. I'm not trying to be able to push the mom out of the way. The mom is crucial in being able to raise children. But we all have our own roles. Like Pastor Daniel said earlier, all right, there are dad jobs and there's mom jobs. The dad job in this case is to be able to raise kids up. To be able to control that anger, to be able to control those things that might be out there in their lives. Now, if the mom is doing it and she doesn't have the equipment to be able to handle that thing, that kid, that kid's going to grow up confused. Because the, the, when a kid picks up a stick and it turns into a sword and he's out there and he's fighting a tree or something like that, a mom comes up, no, 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 you might get a splinter, put that down. Well, mom, it's a sword. No, 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 it's a love stick. That's a love stick. Put the, put, put the love stick down. No. All right, guys, we've got to be a generation that teaches kids that we are going to slay the bad guys and protect the princesses. We have to be a generation that does that. And we've got to be okay with that. We've got to step out and lead. 
You know, story here, as I said, you know, I was, a, uh, I was a football coach for a long time, and one of the places I coached at, I coached offensive line. In fact, my offensive line coach from high school is here. Where are you at, Coach Gascan? Back there, okay? Guy that was big influential in, in, in my life right there. Um, but this kid was huge. He was six foot five, 280 pounds, and looked like he belonged on Wisconsin's offensive line. Or Michigan, sorry, Chris. All right? I mean, he was a house. And, and, and he'd get down, and, man, he'd get in a pretty three-point stance. He had the correct weight distribution. He could take those great inside zone steps, and he'd take that step, and he'd pound up field. But right when he got to that guy that he was about to demolish, he would hold back. He'd take that step. He'd get to him, and he'd just kind of stop. And I'd go up to him, and i said, hey, man, you got to fire off into guys. you got to control your block. we got to be out here. we got to be tough. And I never understood why. Until after practice one day, mom was waiting outside, and he ran up to mom, and he had a little brother there, and he went to pick up the little brother to tell him hello, and mom goes, be careful, be gentle with him. Next day, I wanted to get to know the kid a little bit better. I said, hey, man, tell me about your home. Oh, well, I was raised by my mom. My, my, my dad's never really been around. Whew, all right. I knew that the entire time he's been told that that stick was a love stick, got to be gentle. Can't go out there and be a beast. Can't go out there and own a guy on a block. <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> that guy, that, that young man is playing college football right now and is living his best life uh, as an offensive tackle at a Division II place uh, down the road a little bit. But, uh, guys, we have to be able to step up as dads to be able to, to push kids on to, to what they think that they can't do and, and be able to be the man of the household. Another thing it says here is it goes on and it says, provoke not your children to wrath. Well, how can kids be provoked in today's world? Well, absentee dads is the way that kids are provoked. You know, if, if, if you're so much about work and you're not around your kids enough, guys, uh, you know, I've been to weddings before to where dads were set to the side and uncles walked their daughter down the aisle. And they want to know, well, I'm the, I'm the dad. You know, how, how, come, how come I'm not walking? No, 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 you're not the dad. You're the biological father. There's a big difference between it right there, guys. There's a huge difference in between being a dad and being a biological father. Time is slipping away. And this is one that might hurt too, but guys, divorce. Divorce is a way to provoke kids. And I'm not saying that God doesn't heal out of divorce, but if, if you split up and you break up that family, uh, the kid might be a little bit provoked about that, a little bit upset on it. Matthew 19 tells us, let no man divide what God's put together. And you got to understand this, guys. God hates divorce. He hates divorce. And then also the harsh dad. I've seen dads who can't turn off the, one of the guys mode. They've got a kid, and they, 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 they call it busting chops. Oh, Junior, I'm just busting your chops. Out there playing baseball. You know, hey, man, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. I need to get you a tennis racket so you might actually be able to, to, to contact a ball. Kid, kid's destroyed by that. Hey, man, I'm just kidding around. I'm busting your chops. Don't do that, guys. Don't do that. That, that hurts kids. That, that provokes them. Another one here, like we talked about a little bit earlier, and this is going to the slides here. Most of what your children learn is caught and not taught. We got to be the man that you want your son to be and your daughter to marry. You got to be a man that you want your son to be and your daughter to marry. And it's really easy here, guys. I really think that in the world we live in today, that 90% of what kids learn is caught, and about 10% of, of what they get in their head is taught. I really believe that. They, they, they are watching us, guys, and they are watching us close. You know, I, I loved it. This morning, I got to, I got to meet, where's, where's Simon and Gabriel at? They, there they are right there. I mean, I got to hang out with them a little bit this morning, and Simon has taken role in this young man's lives and bringing him up here to church and being able to introduce him to men of faith like y'all right here, and that is great. That's what we need right there. Great job, man. Gabriel, we're glad that you're here. God has a plan for you, young man. But he's catching it. He's catching it from Simon. Now, Simon's going to teach them, but man, actions, guys, actions, they're going to speak louder than words. It's just truth. If you, if, if, if you want your kid to be a jerk, then you be a jerk. If you want your kid to be rebellious, you be rebellious. If you want your kid to be in the ministry, you be in the ministry. 
You want your kid to, to, to know biblical truths, then you read the Bible. If you want your kid to be an alcoholic, you be an alcoholic. If you want your kid to be in a pornography, you be in a pornography. Guys, it's up to us. It really is up to us in the path that we take for these kids. Raising the child is the dad's responsibility. Culture says that ladies are to raise the kids, but they also say that moms need to work. So who is actually raising the kids? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's the schools. It's the schools, and then exactly it is the next thing. It is that little black box that they're carrying around. Those are the things that are teaching our kids. And I'm going to do a quick plug because I, I believe in this place, but Vintage Christian Academy is a place for kids to be able to grow in biblical truth, Christ-centered values, and that cell phone, as the principal of this place, I better not stink and see it out. I better not. And we'll get into how discipline happens here in a second. But I don't want to see that phone out there. Guys, have y'all read in the paper what our local districts are having to do to get kids off a phone? A magnetic bag? It's a real thing. Look it up. That's about, they're spending millions of taxpayers' dollars to be able to buy magnetic bags. They're trying. They're trying. But here, we're not even going to let it in the door. And if we see it, then we're going to have another issue. But we also have to understand, guys, that when it comes down to it, that when the school is raising our kids, that they get, and y'all might have heard it before, there are 16,000 hours, 16,000 hour wars being fought. Between the time they're in kindergarten to the time that they're a senior in high school, they're going to spend 16,000 hours in front of somebody educating them. Where is it and who is it is very important. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that. The next part here is bring them up. That means raise them, guys. The world tells us that when we get home that we're just punching the clock. That, 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 that when we get home, man, we're like... You were like Fred Flintstone, man. We break that rock, we slide down the back of the brontosaurus, we're in the car, and we're sitting at home. Hey, honey, my Dr. Pepper ain't going to get itself. Let's go, chop, chop. Guys, that's Neanderthal man stuff. When you get home, it should be game on. Doesn't Jesus say, aren't there 12 hours in a day? He says that, right? So you spend eight hours at work. Those four hours when you get home, you better be pouring into your family. You better be in tune with your wife. It is okay for you to be able to tell the kids to go off and play and you sit down with your wife and you get in tune with her. And you find out a junior had issues. <laughs> and then you go back there and you talk to him about those issues. It's not about sitting down in the recliner and checking out. It's not about hopping on your cell phone and checking out, guys. We've got to be in tune with our family and in tune with our wives. Next it says, in the discipline, not disciplining your children is abusive. Not disciplining your children is abusive. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up the child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. How many of us know that training requires discipline? Raise your hand if you've got to wake up for PT. Or if you've had to wake up for PT, right? All right, so, so you understand, guys, training and discipline tie in together. There's a direct tie between these things. And we have to be able to train kids in the discipline. Now, when I talk about discipline here, guys, I am in no way saying that any sort of child abuse is, is good. It's not. If, if, if you get some, you, you should, you should have, it should hurt you to be able to uh, discipline your children. It should, but we've got to be able to do it. And if you get some sort of pleasure out of disciplining your kids, you're doing it wrong. And Jesus tells us when he's sitting in Capernaum and there's all those uh, millstones around, they, they did an archaeological dig at the city of Capernaum. And they found all these huge millstones. They're like, man, this, this place was really into grain. And they were really, really into to eating grain around this spot. No, it was a millstone factory. And Jesus was sitting there, and he told those guys, if any of you abuse children, it's better for you to tie one of these around your neck and throw yourself into the river. And I still believe that today. I think that's biblical truth. So when we discipline kids, it has to be in a way that is lifting them up, it should be in a way that is encouraging, and it should be in a way that is going to point them to God. And the last one here says, instruction of the Lord. Take your home to church and take church back to your home. There has to be a mix of those things right there. It can't be separate, gentlemen. There has to be home and church and a mixture in order for us to have biblical families. It's just the way that it is. A child's 
actions are a reflection of their spiritual health. It says in the Bible, in Proverbs 27, 19, as the water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Be in an area that's going to give the child a great reflection. Surround them with people that are going to be able to have them instructed in the ways of the Lord and to be able to be pushed into what God has planned for us. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, as I wrap this thing up right here, I want to let you know that God has a plan for you, your family, or your future family from today on. And I want to challenge you to be able to, if guys, if the direction hasn't been good, redirect. Turn the car around. Be able to find the direction that we need to go. And we have to have trust that God is going to do that. Last thing here, guys, story about trust. Businessman gets on a plane, sits down, three seats. On the window is a lady looking at her cell phone. In the middle is the, his seat, and on the aisle is a, is, a, is a little child, little boy. And they get off, the plane takes off, and all of a sudden they hit some turbulent weather. Right, any of y'all ever been in a plane in turbulent space? That thing's bouncing around. People are screaming. The, the oxygen mask drops down. And, and the lady is over there intently praying. She's put her phone away now, and now she's praying. The guy's looking around, and he's freaking out. And he looks over at this kid, and this kid is as calm as can be. Calm as cucumber. I mean, cool as cucumber right there. Just, just, just steady as ever, reading his comic book. The plane's bouncing around. He's just reading his book. Well, finally the pilot comes over to the PA and says, we're sorry about those turbulent forces right there. Uh, we're going to be making our landing soon. Please be able to put your seats, uh, seat trays in the upright position. And everybody starts breathing a sigh of relief. And this guy looks over at the kid and says, you are one of the bravest young men I've ever seen in my life. How is it that when everybody else is around you is freaking out, how is it that you are so calm in that situation? And the kid looks at him dead in the eyes and said, my dad's the pilot, and he's taking me home. <laughs> Trust in the dad. Trust in the father. Guys, know that Jesus has a plan. If you're going through turbulent times right now, he is going to get you through it. Trust in him. Let him be your pilot. And, and, and as, as we wrap up today, guys, I need you all to, to be able to understand that it doesn't matter where you've been. It's all about where we're headed. It's all about where you're headed. And if, 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 if it's one of those things, gentlemen, to where if you haven't submitted your life to Christ and you haven't accepted him as your pilot, there's no better day, day than today. There's no better day than today. If you haven't submitted yourself to service in this church, there's no better day than today. Guys, get out there and serve. Be a part of the service team of men. How awesome would it be if the ladies out there didn't have to be here at all today? They could just go home and hang out. Guys, go talk to Chris, man. Go, go, go have a conversation with him about how you can get plugged in and served. He wants to have that conversation with you. Everybody talks about the size of his arms, but gentlemen, the size of this man's heart is huge. And, and I, I'll be honest, it's a, yes, you can clap on that. And he wants to serve, and he wants to lead men. Don't let that reference slip away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for, for just being here today. Thank you for these men in this room. Help us to be, able to, to be able to just walk with you, God, to trust you as our pilot so that we can be able to, to live a life more abundantly. When we follow biblical truths and we are disciplined in those guys, our families will prosper, God. We ask today that uh, as, as some of us have lost fathers uh, recently, that we are able to remember them in good spirits and the good times that we had. For those in here that are dads that need to make reconnection, be able to help put that on their hearts. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give it up for Coach B.